Hi everyone. Welcome to Youth Voice Youth Pride, a SAC virtual film series and discussion. My name is Guillermina Zabala. I'm the Media Arts Director of SAC. Today we'll be hearing from three young filmmakers who are also alumni from the SAC Media Arts Program. Yumi Park, class 2009, Alejandro Peña, class 2012, and Carlo Rodriguez, class 2020. The event will start with the filmmakers' presentations, 15 minutes each, and then we'll open up for a Q&A. Uh, as audience members, please share your questions and comments in the chat. Now, I uh, would like to introduce our moderators, media arts students, Paige Hernandez and Kristen Quintanilla. Hello, my name is Paige Hernandez. I go by they them pronouns, and currently I am a senior in the MAS program at SAC. Hello, my name is Kristen Quintanilla and I go by she, her pronouns, and I am a graduating senior from the media arts program at SAC as well. The first film of the night will be titled Sky by filmmaker Yumi Park. After graduating from Texas with degrees in radio, television, and film and sport management, Yumi worked as a set PA for a few years before moving to New York City, then working at Instagram in content and policy review. They serendipitously landed at HBO's Creative Services Department as an editing PA in 2019, contributing to campaigns for shows such as Westworld, Room 104, Legendary, and the upcoming reboot of Gossip Girl. At Warner Media, Yumi continues to advocate for LGBTQ plus employees and other marginalized groups in the workplace, while also focusing on connecting fellow creatives to each other to continue telling new and personal stories. Yumi, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, everybody. And we're going to go straight into talking about Sky, which, you know, I originally wrote in 2009, the second half of my senior year. And um, looking back on it, it's always hard to watch your own work, I think, as a filmmaker without seeing all the things you would have changed or how you wish you had written something a little bit differently. Um, but Watching Sky back, you know, it's been almost over 10 years now, is kind of wild to see how it still feels very authentic to today and feelings of just figuring out your identity because I feel, I realized after high school that your identity is constantly found even after you, the first time you come out or as you get older and you learn new words and new ideas and other identities that fit you better, how you continue to grow. And um, I think Sky is just kind of like the first chapter in my life as a filmmaker. And um, I'm definitely super grateful for that opportunity that I got through Stacey and the chance that they took on me and my script because looking back on it, even in 2009, I feel like telling that story as an LGBT youth and about an LGBTQ youth, it was kind of still taboo. Like I was really worried if it was just kind of get taken out of the running very early on because it was such a big topic even then. Um, but I felt really grateful and I still feel very grateful that they took that chance on me in my story because it is very semi-autobiographical autobiographical, how certain pieces in the film are exactly how I came out to my family or to my friends. Like the email scene, I for sure, the first time I ever said those words, hey mom, I'm, I'm gay, was through an email when she was in South Korea visiting her family. And I was too scared to ever say the words to her directly so I just did it in an email um my mom didn't take it quite as nicely but it you know it's a process it's still a process even all these years later um but I love that that part of me is in this film and I love that it is forever documented in that style in a passionate way in an artful way um but I wanted to get into two clips uh if we want to play the first clip uh, I wanted to kind of show the main three characters of the film, which is Skye and her two friends that she starts meeting, if we want to play that. Skye. 
So this scene, and I'm gonna talk, I'm talking over the audio a little bit, but um, I love this tree. We found this tree at Breckenridge Park, and it is huge and it was shaded. And we were shooting in one of the hottest summers in San Antonio on record that summer. Uh, so shaded was our kind of our godsend at that time. Um, and what I love is actually the interaction between Gigi, the actress, and Stephanie, who I actually went to high school with. Um, and it felt very playful. And it's kind of, it reminds me of all of my friends who were also kind of guiding me through this identity crisis of like, am I, aren't I, and creating like an example, but also watching from a distance, like letting me find myself. And I really love to show that through this scene of like, Sky is also figuring it out and they're watching her figure it out. And I just thought that scene is one of my favorite parts. Like the humor of it all is like something that I connect with a lot because awkwardness and teen angst and all that, like we all went through it, but the running joke in the queer community is that we kind of all live our teen years as tw- in our, into our twenties because we finally feel like we can live that life we wish we had as teenagers of like awkward dating or like crushes and like being able to be open about it. So I love that I could document that kind of, that part of the process of um, just coming out and coming to terms with your own self. And then um, I also wanted to play this last clip and I'll set it up. It's actually the moments after Sky comes out to her best friend who she has a crush on who she was very fearful about how Caden would take it. Um, it does not go well. It's like the worst possible case scenario for her. Um, so this scene that we're gonna watch is her process, right? She's like figuring it out. And we're back at Brackenridge Park, which I love. It's a beautiful scene, but it's in the evening time now. And visually, I just loved how it looked because our cinematographer, John Strong, um, he, was just so great at knowing when to kind of be static and then when to like go handheld and create movement to show that kind of disarray and chaos and frustration you start to feel when people don't take it very well. As we continue to watch this, I want to make note of the music that we use in this film. Um, in, my, in my high school life, I had two really great friends who were musicians, and one of them actually built himself a home studio. And so they provided music not only for this film, but also some of my films prior to that. And I am very passionate about music and the combination of music and video is something very important to me in the way I like to make films. Um, And the work I do now at HBO has a huge emphasis on the kinds of music we use and how we edit towards music. And um, I love the soundtrack of Sky. It has the, the kinds of emotions I really wanted to play into. They were really able to capture that and I thought that they did a wonderful job of helping me convey the emotions that Sky was going through throughout the film. And so when you consider the final shot of Julia, where she, like, I wasn't sure how I wanted that scene to really look as far as like the final shot before, you know, we resolve it. But I did feel like we needed like an emotional climax, but I didn't want it to be too much. I wanted her, I wanted you to feel it, but I also wanted it to feel authentic. And back then, like crying wasn't a thing that I found 
personally to be not a show of weakness, right? I think as I've gotten older, I've really become very secure in my relationship with crying. Um, but back then I was like, you don't show emotion in that sense. And so it took a little debate within me whether or not I wanted to show her having that moment of like a tearful moment. And I do love that we ended up going for like a single tear or like a very like soft cry. Um, I think that if I hadn't done it and I was looking back on it now, I would have regretted it. Um, but I thought Julia did a wonderful job of really conveying that disappointment. I think that heartbreak in her, it wasn't, it wasn't about like the possibility of like losing out on a crush. Like this was like my biggest fear as a person coming out as a young person was, I don't care if they don't really like me because I'm gay. I care if I lose people I care about that I consider my best friends that I look to as like, you know, the first relationships I was having as an adult, a young adult was very much the importance of friendship in my life. And the possibility of losing those friendships was my biggest fear. So that was her biggest fear realized. But then as the film resolves, like she realizes like, people like that who choose to discontinue a relationship because of your identity and you being true to yourself, it felt very much like, no, like the people that stuck around are the most important and those are the people you should recognize. So um, yeah, I have found new, renewed love for Sky. I always think about it. I like to tell people I peaked in high school because I feel like that's a piece of work that I'm super proud of to say that was like my real first short film, like a very large project. It's 30 minutes long. Um, Gisha told me that was probably the last summer that they had the summer short film program because of just how prolonged it was. It was a very large undertaking for us. And um, yeah, I thought that it was a wonderful experience and I know that nowadays people like to think that oh we don't need stories about coming out anymore everybody comes out every day and I tend to disagree with that like sometimes I'm on the fence about it but then I remember that while the the world and society and parents are more forgiving and even kids like Gen Z are way more open to that idea more supportive I look and think at all the news articles of kids still being you know, murdered by their own families or still being kicked out. Like LGBT youth are still, you know, the highest proportion of the homeless youth population. Um, and I just think about all the kids who are still afraid to come out, whatever the situation may be. And I think that there are just always gonna be new ways to tell the coming out story because everybody's experience is so different. You know, there are gonna be people that come out way later in life you know they've had kids they've got married and then they have come out finally and say like look this is not the life that's authentic to me and I don't want to live that anymore you know those are stories that I can't wait to see either the stories of the late bloomers or the people that chose to have the uh, heteronormative nuclear family life before they really put their self-love at the forefront like I can't wait to wait tell those stories or see those stories um and I just I just I'm proud that Sky is part of that lexicon of the progression of our society at least I hope so and if there's any more questions I will I'll be here to field any of those extra questions at the end of the program as well Thank you very much, Yumi Park. I know when I watch Sky, it, it very much touched me. It was really good. Uh, our next filmmaker that we have to introduce is a uh, 2012 graduate of CC, Alejandro Peña, who wrote and directed the film Pedazos. Alejandro Peña is an LA-based experimental artist born and raised here in San Antonio, Texas. He first began making short films at the age of 17, which ranged from handmade animations to special effects. His short films mix acting with distorted narrative structures and vibrant fever dream textures and colors. His body of film work from 2012 to 2016 includes a music video and four short films, two of which screened at festivals around the world. Currently, Alejandro is primarily a painter and photographer, though he hopes to start making short films again soon.
take it away. Oh, <clears throat> hi. Thanks for the intro. Um, uh, wait. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, that was my uh, BFA. I went to Emerson College in Boston. And so I got a BFA there. And then, you know, they ask you to make a your final like thesis before you graduate college. So I ended up making um, this pretty, pretty wacky queer um, experiment. It kind of was an experiment, to be honest, visually. Um, I wanted to make, so actually just like Yumi, when I graduated from CC, I made a short film um, about coming out. Similarly, I also, that's when I came out to my parents. <laughs> um, so then I went to college and my style and techniques and what I was interested changed a, a lot. So when I was time to graduate college, I was like, oh, I want to make a short film about, you know, with queer themes in it. Now that I'm gone through four years of college, see what, you know, spews out of my little head. And so at that point in time, I was really, really, really interested not really so much in writing or dialogue or too much about narrative, but more about visual experimentation, uh, visual effects, uh, special effects, animation, and costume design and painting. So more, more not as not as like structured. So I basically I didn't even have a script at all. Um, I mostly had it. We just went off of a storyboard. Um, and I had a lot of people at school that were constantly professor teachers they were like, uh, you're not, what are you doing? Because Emerson's really like narrative writing based. And so I knew that I wanted it to be about two guys who are clearly dealing with some sort of like riff in their friendship, in this case, you know, some sort of like buried feelings. Um, that's the story. But um, I wanted it to be, I, I became like really obsessed with like specific colors for almost like two years, like literally just four colors, like pink, orange, red, yellow. Um, and so as I was developing a one sentence story, like half idea, I was also developing mostly the techniques that I was gonna use. Um, so then I was like, so, so that, the idea would pop up and then I would figure out, oh, how can we do this visually? So I was like, oh, I kind of want to make a fake cave because I we shot on a soundstage. So everything was completely blue screened. Everything was like put together all in post, like absolutely every single thing. Um, so after I came up, after I was inspired by this just vi strictly visual idea of I want to make a fake cave, um, that's when the part of the story where they get pushed down into like some underworld area happened and it kind of fed into some sort of you know thing that like i mean you know there are like a lot of concert like conservatives that think if you're gay or lgbtq or, or anything like you're going to go to hell right so then i was like oh, okay so i guess what i'm trying to say is with the visual curiosity and the technique i was curious about when that popped up, that's when the next idea would pop up. So I would call myself an experimental filmmaker because I sort of, it was like digging up a fossil. It was like, as I like dug up, I dug, the film was made as I was coming up with it, <laughs> which is not, you know, recommended. I don't, I don't, I don't know what's recommended or what isn't, but um, uh, yeah. And I learned a lot about um, special effects. Um, oh, another thing is, um, I, I think I just got really into costume making and growing up, my parents would always take me to Mexico, like all the time, just to go see like Aztec and like Mayan ruins. And I became really, I think I took a, hist a class um, about history and they like completely not, they like really skipped over like most of like Mesoamerican history. And I was like, well, that was upsetting. So then I started reading it, reading stuff on my own. And then I was like, oh, let's give this like some sort of like indigenous Mesoamerican inspired theme. But obviously I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be real about it. So I ended up turning into this like 
sort of like space glam rock kind of indigenous like look which ended up being really fun like kind of dr susie um yeah and and the two the two main actors um they're not necessarily indigenous so it's 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 like it was sort of a uh just like my world that i was just kind of mixing up in my head not really like a, a the, the inspiration came from so many different directions uh, that I ended up producing this weird sort of play-like looking, not really fake, not really realistic, sort of like whimsical uh, situation. <laughs> yeah. Oh, how long do I have? Uh, what else should I say? <laughs> yeah, sure. Totally. Cool. So that is a clip where you realize, oh, there are buried feelings here, uh, sexual tension. Um, I started learning 3D software. So um, I, was, I was also inspired by a couple of films at the time. And I, in terms of structure, this is like the middle section of the short. Um, that I wanted to be like this sort of section of like visuals, experimentation, a reveal of like, oh, this is, these are the two characters. This is what's going on between them. And then also sort of like this very dreamy sort of uh, montage that you sort of like drown, drown in for a couple of minutes. Um, I had a lot of fun uh, putting all those visuals together. <laughs> Um, like a lot, uh, all the puppets and everything, and uh, just creating out all the fake backdrops and and then of course the costumes too. Um, just really fun to make. Uh, yeah, a lot of After Effects, like a lot, the whole, like the whole thing almost. <laughs> and uh, you, yeah, you can play the other clip if you if you want. Oh man, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at it and I just remember how much fun and like really difficult it was to, to shoot. Um, oh, one thing I haven't talked about yet is, uh, well, music is a big part of the short because there's no dialogue at all. So um, the music was happened sort of the same way that the filmmaking happened. Um, basically, I 
have a friend who lives in New York who's a really talented musician. I was like, hey, I, I love all the sounds you make. Um, I'm about to make a short film. Um, I don't want you to use any real instruments at all. And I also wanted to sort of experiment with him because I knew what he could do, but I basically would just send him images. And I'd be like, just make weird, whatever weird sounds like you think this goes with this. And it was an interesting collaboration because I was almost like never like not pleased. Like in that last scene, I, the it's not a song, I don't know what it is, but he added this like weird, really creepy, like undulating, like, like scream thing I don't know um but I ended up loving it and so the, when I was at Stacey I really tried to get into the whole screen like writing a script like making people believe in like real characters and then once I got to college I realized that like filmmaking doesn't have to be like that it can be very much like a free-for-all or like an experiment where you discover new skills and discover you know what's inside of your own head um, as you go along and um, so yeah the music I was really happy with all the music it's pretty it's pretty wacky freaky stuff I love it um, and yeah it's it, it's something that was born out of me just wanting to learn how to use or like create like a, my own world and then also learn learn a lot of technical things as I was making it that I didn't know how to do before um, yeah like when you see the the crowds and stuff in the short it's really just like two or three people um which was fun to do yeah that's all i got until questions i guess awesome thank you so much alejandro your film was awesome thanks awesome. um <laughs> our final film of the night that we'll be discussing is tie by filmmaker carlo rodriguez Stacey alumni Carlo Antonio was born in San Antonio, Texas. Carlo's art focuses on how personal experiences influence human connection. He utilizes his own experiences as a gay man to portray the obstacles that prevent him from, that prevented him from obtaining a human connection with others. He hopes that anyone who encounters his work will reflect and relieve any borders that they've placed around themselves. Carlo believes that once people rid themselves completely of these borders, it would allow them to establish deep, strong, and powerful connections with others and themselves, allowing the world to become a better, more unified and accepting place. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, this being my first film, it has definitely been um, very honorable to have worked with such amazing artists. I am so grateful to Alex and Gisha first of all, and to Stacey for allowing me to talk right now. Um, and like Mr. Alejandro and Yumi, it's it's very a long process to talk about and to sum up within 15 minutes. You know, we spent months or even Alejandro, he just went straight through it. And that's just, you know, crazy to think about. But our stories are just so important. Like it's not, we can't stress it enough to be, um, just talking about this, you know, I think it just needs to be heard. And for my film um, specifically, I was really utilizing the aspect of being on the aut autistic spectrum while being LGBT. I wanted to focus on this because it's such an unheard topic and I feel like it should have um, been talked about a little bit more. And with the crew and the research and everything that I went through, um, I was happy with the result. Um, I made sure that everything that was put and said and d displayed was accurate and um, represented the community well. Um, and it was a long and tedious process. Um, I originally, our script was supposed to be 15 minutes long and 15 pages, but mine was like 30 pages, like it was too much and I had to cut it down and it's the, one of the hardest things to do, but um, that's when I learned about like visual representation and the actors and their, their movements and their emotions and their feelings can really display a good story without having, you know, 15 extra pages. Um, so I was really lucky to do that. And I just believe like this story is so close to home. Um, like in the beginning, you see that he's struggling going to new school and, you know, and having these awkward interactions with people just because, you know, he's somewhere new, 
Um, in my life, I've been going to a lot of schools and I've had these same experiences, but um, I thought it would be better to highlight how would that be when you have the Asperger's, which just makes it a little bit harder. Um, and so I wanted to, to display that, to display the boundary that it's put around these people that have, that shouldn't be there. They need to be treated the same way everyone else is and even with more love and attention. Um, and so I put that aspect in there, but this film is so personal to me when it comes to the LGBT aspect of it. Um, I have, um, as a gay man, you know, and as a gay people, we have all these experiences that are so unique to us because it's something that's out of the normal or what we would call normal. Um, and so I wanted to incorporate that as well to keep it personal and at home and something I can relate to. I wanted to create a film that is not just for entertainment, but something that people can learn and um, to um, work on themselves. I feel like for me, that's what I was learning a lot too when I was creating this film, when creating with all these different artists, it's you get a lot of, um, I would say info or feedback that is very useful. And um, I'm very blessed and lucky to know all these people in my life. Kristen, I believe you were there. I, I, There's many people on this set. It was a, it was a hard, um, I think like four or five days, you know, they felt like weeks, but finishing it and seeing the output, I remember crying on that last night. So I was like, I am really lucky to be able to create this. And I even cried at the movie theater when we watched it because just seeing it um, on the big screen and everything. Um, but I think like, even when he in the clip, we, um, the first clip I think we have to show is the gym scene between Ty and Austin. Um, before we show it, I just want to describe, um, it was, uh, this was to show, you know, I had 15 pages of like building that relationship of between these two characters. But besides doing that, I just decided, or I, with the assistance I had decided to um, put a montage and put like this connection between and to show that, you know, within time, um, strong connections, even with differences, people can still come together. And I wanted to show that visually. So um, if it's cool to show that. Everyone grab your partner and be ready to hit the workout stations. Come on, let's go. Uh, hi, my name's Ty. Do you want to be partners? I'm actually already with a partner, sorry. Oh, yeah, uh, Austin. Austin and I are partners. Maybe another time, though? Okay. Hey, Austin, we're partners, right? Actually, him and I are going to be partners. Sorry. Hey, I don't remember us being partners. It's fine. I didn't want to be partners with her. Okay. Well, I'm Ty. I'm Austin. So um, I first want to say that our actor for Cynthia, the uh, other girl in the scene, she had a hard time dealing with the scene because she felt so, um, like she didn't feel like she wanted to display that to someone. It was hard for her to do. But um, after, the, uh, after the scene is when the montage happens. But right now you see the initial spark between the relation, relationship between Ty and Austin. Um, I wanted it to be to where you kind of see Austin come out of his way to help someone. Um, rather than being out of the blue, because you can see that, um, I think I would say spark or ignition to help. Um, and you and that's what I have, um, what I want to display to the community, that there are people there. And I've been lucky enough to meet those people who want to reach out and help to those people that might need it. You know what I mean? And he saw this um, from Cynthia that she was showing some um, distaste towards Ty because of um, she had heard of his um, Asperger's. And so you see that um, this relationship that they're gonna build does not um, surround itself within this boundary of um, being on the autistic spectrum. And then um, on the next scene um, that I can show in a little bit is gonna show the love of a mother and to her son who is um, facing a hardship. Personally, the love of my mother has helped me through many hardships. And I wanted to display that, but I wanted to display it to the part where this, um, that he, she, he never even states that he um, had a kiss with Austin. He just states that he's having an internal struggle. 
And I feel like this is how it's been in my life. There's been an inter internal struggle and my mom has never explicitly said the, the um, oh, oh, what I'm trying to say, like, it was never explicitly said, but it was known and she still displayed that love. And I wanted to show that if people have seen the movie Love, Simon, um, there is a scene in that movie where the mom sits down with Simon and says, like, shows her unconditional love to him. And that was what I wanted to show, that unconditional motherly love that is there no matter the um, boundaries that are placed without, or around their children. And I wanted to show that. And it's a very heartfelt scene. The mother, Gloria, is amazing. She's an amazing actor. And um, uh, we can, if we can show that um, clip, that would be amazing. What are you doing, honey? Just working on schoolwork. Busy. You know, whenever you want to talk to me about what happened at Austin's, you can tell me. Well, what is there to talk about? You haven't been to school in two weeks. I really thought you were enjoying it. You know I only want what's best for you. And if you feel like you want to stay home and not go to school, that's okay. I just don't want you to regret it later. And you know what I've learned? I've learned that we can't control everything, and it's okay. You taught me that, I. You. And look at you. You've become a man, and oh, you were so much more happier when you were in school, and I just, I hope that you keep that happiness. Awesome. Um, I remember when we first finished that scene, I was bawling my eyes out. It was the first time we did the, the scene. We finished our shot, and I'm an emotional person. Gloria herself, she um, told me beforehand that this was a conversation she had, which she had with her mother. And then um, Jacob, the actor for Ty, said that this is a conversation that he had his, with his mother. So all of us coming from this um, LGBT background and having this very you know heartfelt conversation, at the end of it, the room was silent. It was very just like, I was on the verge of just tears of just like, this was on the spot. And it was um, more of our personal connection with the um, with Ty as a character, with the conversation that we wish that everyone can have in the LGBT community, you know? And luckily right now, like yeah, um, Naomi mentioned was, you know, it's happening more, but it's not happening always, you know? And, it, and we really should be opening for these conversations. So. What I wanted to display in, in Thai was how we can have that conversation, how the conversation can sound like, not word for word for what Gloria said, but word for more of the idea of what she was trying to portray, which was, you are my child, you are my love, and I will make sure to develop, uh, keep on pouring that into you. And so Thai as a whole was to show the representation of, you know, the hardships of what, you know, it is being on the LGBT and the autistic spectrum and to show how we can start helping helping to, or how we can start helping them, you know, and then showing what boundaries that we might already be placing and how we can remove those boundaries, which is how Cynthia was quick to judge and how the counselor was being rude, even though you would assume like counselors know, you know, some counselors not always do. It's to show that everyone should be held accountable and that everyone is going to, um, and it's a working process, you know what I mean? And that's what Gloria, um, Gloria's character is symbolizing that in the beginning, she condensed or um, contained a tie in a small like um, box. But at the end of the film, you see that she's like, you know what, that was my fault. I understand that. And I saw what I what happened in the growth that you had when I let you out. So I'm going to continue pouring that love as you're finding yourself. And that's what I would hope any parent or any adult would treat anyone. You know what I mean? Um, so my, my film just serves as a representation of what could be. Thank you.
Great. Well, thank you so much, Yumi, Alejandro, and Carlo. Thank you for using your backgrounds as filmmakers and as artists to uplift queer stories by queer voices, which is the most important thing we can have right now. Uh, we will now open up the floor to the Q&A section. So please submit your questions if you have any. Uh, so we don't have any so far from the uh, group chat. Uh, I will go ahead and ask a question I have personally. Um, this one is kind of just for uh, all three artists. Uh, what are your personal feelings as people who have made films regarding being queer or coming out, and some of which being more kind of on the happier spectrum of stories? What are your feelings towards the depiction of queer pain in mainstream media over genuinely happy stories from LGBT folk and their identities? Um, I can probably, I'll jump in first. I think it's a very fine line um, when it comes to the exploitation of queer pain, as you um, phrased it. I do think that it is important still to be very blunt about just how much violence all LGBTQ people have experienced in some way. They all happen at different levels, but, and there are different groups within our community that have faced even more trauma than some of us in particular, such as, you know, black trans women are still some of the like highest numbers of violence and you know I think that it's it's become somehow quote-unquote cool to be like you know black lives matter or black trans lives matter but I want to see more of those stories as you said that uplift these communities not just show their pain like I don't it's really hard for me as all in a, as a storyteller but also as a community member and also as a consumer of media to continue to see only pain in our community because, you know, I do still, I, I want others to empathize with us and I want people to see that these issues still exist and that they also need to help us and others combat these issues. But I also want to show what could be. I think that, you know, in this age and era of so much anti-trans youth legislation right now, I, I'm more concerned of showing, you know, trans youth right now, there is a future. And I wanna show that there is hope that like, no matter what these politicians have, who have no idea what they're going through might be trying to do, they have a whole community of people globally that support them, that want to see them make it past their next birthday or past 18, we know that, there are opportunities for them to live and to thrive. And it seems so far away, right? When you're in high school or a teenager, things feel so much more uh, like concentrated. And it's just about like the now, the present, like how I feel now. And it's hard to imagine a future, but I do think that positive representation can mean so much to somebody that doesn't feel like they have anything to live for because of the pain that they're feeling right now. And so, you know, it's very not, it might be naive to say that I want more positive stories about our community and not to show the pain. I understand there's power in showing the pain, but unless it's done by somebody that is of the community, that is of that authentic experience, I have a hard time supporting it because it doesn't feel as authentic for a cis white person to try and tell the story of a black trans woman. It's not the same, but I guess they could tell more hopeful stories if they're done the research right it's usually more helpful if you have of experience in the writer's room or directing or producing to make sure authentic choices are made to tell those stories awesome thank you so much and now i think we have some audience questions as well um this one from olivia says, very lucky to have gotten to work with all of you in some way. So proud of the work you do. 
have these films inspired your future work in any way? Um, my work on Thai has definitely inspired me a lot. Um, I feel like, like even for all of us, like the, the, the sets and the process and everything, I think when I first completed, because Thai was my first film completing by myself, or not by myself, but I'm on directing, um, I remember like finishing every um, like finishing every set day and then feeling like wow that was a good day and so in a way that I am um, Thai has really given me an opportunity to understand the power of film. Um, I have gotten comments from people that are um, use my film as a as a little gateway to you know understand um, like a lot of people have said like wow like the I it's a different type of um, film when it comes to you know like I was saying it's like the gay films that show the, the happiness and the, the pain, but you see that it's coming from a different, uh, a part of it also another different community, which would be the autistic or the autism community. And so you see that um, it's, it's showing that they can be represented well and represented even if, you know, they're not, um, even, even if they're not right now. The, the, my, my whole way that I even got the inspiration was seeing a, a movie about a, a guy with Asperger's. So this, my film has definitely inspired me to make more personal films like this, especially going on different communities as well. Um, for me, um, I, I think my answer doesn't um, necessarily have to do with um, uh, being queer or, um, but I, I, it has inspired me. The film did inspire my future work by, in terms of like the process of, of making it, um, the, the just the experimental aspect. And also um, I just got really, really into painting. I haven't made a short film in four years. I do a lot of just visual stuff. <laughs> and um, and uh, I also, it also inspired my future work um, because I'm just very, very much into uh, like motion graphics and uh, and uh, production design and, and that sort of thing. So in terms of like the things I want to do in the future, it definitely sort of made me realize uh, where like my passions uh, are. Yeah. I think it's I'm on the same boat as Alejandro in terms of like not focusing as much on personal make like filmmaking. Um, I did produce and also write and direct, wrote and directed a shorter film for a competition that I haven't actually completed. Um, but it was another angle of coming out. It was a different person, but it was the the story I didn't tell in Sky. You know, Sky doesn't come out to her father because of her reasons stated in the film. Um, and ironically, after college, that was the story that I wanted to show was, you know, this character was going to try and come out to her dad in a more humorous way. I wanted to try humor. Um, and I think now that I've been even further removed from personal filmmaking, I've realized that like my biggest goal is helping other queer creatives connect with other queer creatives. I think that some of my um, or my biggest pro to my personality is that I love meeting different people and I'm very good at meeting different kinds of people but then keeping them in mind for other friends and creatives and helping them collaborate in their own projects. I think um, my personal goal in my continued work is to continue uplifting as many queer voices and stories as I can in my own way whether it be putting out calls for trans feminine voice actors to be over a new marketing campaign or things of that nature. I love knowing that I can make my own difference. Even if it's not my short film, I can help somebody else tell their story. And I think that is something that we can all do. We all have our own little platforms um, and you don't have to necessarily be a filmmaker to do so as well. Thank you guys. Uh, the next question we have is one uh, aimed specifically at uh, Carlo. Uh, it's from Cassidy. I'm always interested in the process of how things are made, including research. So in making Thai, what exact kind of research did you do to understand the topic of, you know, coming out and being gay, but also being somebody who is autistic? And um, 
a uh, side note for me, I'm also a queer autistic person. So like Thai is like super great for, for me personally. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I'm happy that it, that it ties out for you. Um, for me per personally, when I was doing your research, man, I went on a two week like deep dive into um, autism and Asperger's and everything that I need, could know. Um, and then I personally felt like this wasn't enough because I felt like if I was going to start, you know, going off of what I read in the books, that I wouldn't display well in the character. Um, and I think as I was talking about um, adding this, uh, this um, factor into my film, I was actually approached from someone in the media studio who said that they had Asperger's. Um, and I, I talked to them, I sat down and we, I think we had lunch and I was just like, I want to create a film about a gay person with Asperger's does this make you comfortable? And then what can I do to make sure that I am doing something accurate? I wanna make sure that I'm doing something accurate. I am not over, over exaggerating anything or making something seem less than. Um, and so as we um, talked um, and they were also on my set. So every day I had my, I was filming, they were there making sure I was keeping me accountable, making sure I wasn't doing anything too dramatic or anything like that. So um, my research was more I was going off the books, but also of someone else's personal experiences as being someone that was because they were gay and on, on, on oh my God, on the autistic spectrum as well. And so they were, on, they were both. They were my, my helper and my research, and they made sure that I was making sure that everything I was including was on the dot. And um, they were a great help. And then um, I was adding also my personal experiences. So we had very uh, long and deep conversations about how we can make this film. Um, so something that I would, um, personal to me, but also something that they feel comfortable um, representing them as well, because it represents both us and the um, autistic community as well. Awesome. And then uh, we have another audience question to Alejandro, and it is, what was it like going from making more narrative style films to more experimental style films? Um. It was interesting um, because when I was at CC, I thought I was, I, I, I'm glad I, I tried writing um, and I gave it my best shot. Um, and I was really proud of what the, the stuff I made at CC as well. Um, but when I got to college, I sort of saw an opportunity with all these resources to sort of explore a little bit more. So I, I did keep trying to write, um, but I slowly, veered away from writing and more towards uh, um, experimental processes. And um, yeah, I mean, it was like pretty liberating actually. Um, for me, it just kind of, some, something that, um, that Yumi mentioned earlier is something that I kind of felt too. And I this is kind of gets to the question a little bit, but, um, because I didn't come out until like the end of high school, when I got to college, I, f I felt weird because I felt like, wait, are these my teenage years, even though I was in college? So then I got to college and I was like, wow, okay, so this is what high school supposed could have been like if, I, if it was okay to, to come out, you know, whatever. Um, and so that sort of like liberating sense sort of gave me this more uh, openness to try out things that were less, you know, not as formulated or not as like, you know, strict as like a script or something like that. So I think that's what happened to me. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense or not. But. And I think we have some, I don't know if we have any other, or we do have other audience questions um, to all the filmmakers. Um, uh, to go along with the question that Sage had, how do you feel about general media making almost all LGBTQ plus uh, movies slash stories uh, about coming out? I, I think I touched upon this a little bit earlier when I was speaking about Sky in particular, um, but there is a variety of different stories. So I do think that it's okay that there are those stories, obviously as, LGBTQ members of the community, we do know that there are stories outside of being, of just coming out. 
Um, we live lives just like everybody else does of heterosexual norm or heteronormative couples. Um, but there is a time, and I think we're seeing it now where we're realizing that there are so many more stories where, you know, being LGBTQ is only part of our like journeys, right? It, it does inform a lot of decisions or it informs a lot of the different kinds of situations we might be put in or the points of views we might have. But um, I do think that it's starting to get a little stale. There are gonna always be beautiful and really interesting coming out stories as time goes. Um, but I do think that there are way more unique stories about being queer that are gonna start being told. I think we've really, reached this new era of television where there everybody's looking for different stories and coming out isn't enough anymore or like I don't want to use the word enough but it's there's like we want to see the after what happens when you come out you know I think we have a lot of young adult books that are starting to come out that are about you know like being a queer girl in high school playing for the football team I have a college friend who's literally writing that book she's about to publish it and it's going to be amazing and I think it's going to be a great movie adaptation and I can't wait for it and that's like kind of based on real life stories you know there's an actual girl in Florida that did that she dated the cheerleader played football was the quarterback like those things are really cool and it's going to be just normal to be like oh this is my girlfriend in an, like a woman loving woman relationship, there's not gonna be this whole like exposition of like, oh my God, I have to come out and then I have to live the rest of my life. Like coming out, as we know, we do it every day, I think as queer people and depending on how we identify and show ourselves, some people do it every day. Some people do it as soon as they walk out every morning. Sometimes they have to do it every time they go to a different job. You know, it's, you know, I think those are different stories that we're lucky to know that exist and I can't wait to see them. And I can't wait for storytellers like Alejandro and Carlo to con and Sage and Kristen and everybody in the art world to continue telling those stories. The future is very bright, I think. Yeah, I, um, oh, you can go. Oh, sorry, my, mine's short. I mean, I just being here with y'all today and talking about all this and, and I just re remembering my days at CC, just from 2012 when I left to go to college to now I've seen a huge difference. I remember being in high school and like every single like episode or you know movie that involved the gay person was like, oh, they're coming out and then wow, oh wow, what's gonna happen? And just within 10 years, it's like, I'll be watching a TV show like just for fun, like a comedy or like a serious movie. And, and I'll realize that it's the focal point is not them coming out, it's like, it's more nuanced than that. They they might just be happen to be gay, and then their their role in the story is like something completely different. Or um, it is about the plot is about being you know queer, LGBT, or trans. But it's it, there's much more other parts of their lives involved, and their desires aren't all about you know just their sexuality. If they're about life, um, so I've seen a huge difference, and I'm and I'm sure it's gonna get more and more like that. Hopefully. Uh, this next question is uh, also for me, sorry. Uh, it actually also goes to Alejandro. Uh, how do you believe that internal fighting has kind of hurt the LGBT community and those trying to open up about their identity? I ask this because in Pedrazos, we get the story of two young men who descend to the underworld for uh, lack of better words and you get this idea that perhaps they are like intimate or like with each other but they're also fighting and they don't want to talk to each other so it's like oh what happened there and i feel like that does speak a lot to like internalized stuff within the queer community that we kind of have to deal with yeah well i mean straight up it just happened to me in high school and it was just like that like but in real life and so it happens it happens a lot you know you're you're trying to figure yourself out and 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 maybe you have a friend who's kind you know and then and then you you love the person but they're not on the same page and it's it's difficult because when you do internalize things um they can 
explode or 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 really damage a relationship uh, or a friendship. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think it's the thing that a lot of uh, LGBTQ people go through uh, before they come out, sort of falling for someone act like a friend or something like that. Yeah. And then this question is for all of the filmmakers, um, but it is just how, or what is your personal approach to directing actors in terms of like how they should move and, you know, talk and um, give the performance that you're looking for that fits your overall vision? For me, I'm like the same specifically for like um, when um, since Claudia was talking to Ty when that heartfelt scene that we showed, the second one, um, I was giving more, less like explaining what I want, but I would give like um, representation. So I would like show them the scene from Love Simon and be like, this is a f the vibe, this is the feeling. And I would do that for the other scenes when it was like um, Cynthia being mean to Ty in the gym scene, I showed the actor a, a scene from Gossip Girl. And I was like, I, I want something like this. I need you to be a little you know, snarky and a little rude. I need something like this. And she's like, okay, I got it. So for me, it's like getting um, like re visual representation of like what I'm looking for from someone else and then incorporating it your own way. And then if there's like something little or anything like that, then I would say like, hey, this or this. But if, if not, most of the actors, you know, just nail it on the dot, you know what I mean? They're like, okay, this is what he wants. I can give you that and I can give you 110 more. You know what I mean? So that's what my method was. For Sky, just remembering, like, there we did do casting calls for the main actors, um, actresses. Um, but, you know, for, like, say, the youth group scene, um, I would say actually the majority of those actors were actually CAC media arts students at the time. So they weren't they weren't necessarily non-actors, but they weren't, like, pro actors either compared to maybe the uh, main cast. And... I think my approach back then that I still kind of use now is I'm not as precious with the dialogue that's written, right? Because in my case, I wrote the film. So I have felt like, you know, if it doesn't feel right in the moment from the person giving it, I'm okay with just trying to explain the situation as best I can and ask them like, you know, how would, did it feel in a similar situation between you and a friend? Or if you were in this position, like how would, what would you feel and what were, what are the kinds of words you might um, use? And so I try to be in that sense, like I really want to make myself more of the actor's director, right? I want to help in that process of just making it feel authentic, not only to the character as written, but to the person playing that character. I think the collaboration between actor and director in that case, I think is something that I personally love. Um, because as such, a, I'm, you know, I'm, I consider myself and I'm known as like very uh, outgoing person. Like I love talking to people. And so I really shoot to um, utilize each actor's personal experience as best as I can to get those kinds of performances. And um, like Carlos mentioned, a lot of those people that do act, you know, once you learn how to speak the language that they need to get the emotion that you were trying to convey they know it it might take one or two cut uh takes but once we get those directions those little things fixed it's like easy going like you only need to do two or three more takes and you, they've got it because that's the amazing thing about actors is that they really know how to like express themselves and that's why they fit that role of being an actor so well and it makes being a director that much easier Wow, I love both y'all's answers. That's so. Since I've moved to LA, I've been wanting to get back, like, get into acting. Um, but I've spent most of that energy trying to figure out how to become an adult and, you know, <laughs> grow up. Um, my answer is kind of funny. Um, so, the short films I made in college, the actors were basically puppets. They were not there to act. Um, they were there to sort of be like mimes. Um, and my process is more like, oh, you need to stand here. Oh, this is the exact timing. Oh, the green screen is going to slide this way. Oh, the shadow comes in. They're mostly uh, 
it's sort of like uh, in a theatrical sense, sort of just not, yeah, kind of like puppets, but also more like, um, yeah, like like a human body, but I'm I'm using to like portray a certain a certain um, visual, you know, artistic uh, vision. And then um, since I've stopped filmmaking for a, a couple of years, that's kind of informed my uh, pho photography work because I do a lot of photography with um, people, and it's more like photo illustration. So it's not like I'm not ever like, oh, this is the emotion. Oh, this is like the story. I'm like, you got to step on here and twist like this so you can hold on to the ceiling and then I'm going to put the octopus on you. You know, is that is that cool with you? No, like, yeah. So it's like, I, it's like more, it's a little bit different. Um, I wouldn't, I call them actors when I would, when I would make these short films. And in Pedazos, they did act, but it was, it was more like very specific sort of mime-like like a mime or like a like a some sort of performance artist, I guess. So this next question is also from the audience. Uh, this one might be a fun one for you, uh, Alejandro. How and it's a general question for everybody, of course. But um, how hard was it to edit your films? I have, this, I have a simpler explanation for my edit. So I was lucky that uh, Olivia, one of my classmates at SAC, she was our designated editor in the credits and everything. So um, my, minus the fact that we had very large files just because we were shooting off the Sony cam, um, the highest quality that we had, plus the lettuce adapter, because back then we weren't shooting on DSLRs just yet for films. Um, so she you know, organize everything. And I really kind of let her take reign on, you know, choosing her best, the best cuts. Um, I'm one of those people that really likes to delegate to others. I feel like are stronger than me at those parts. Like I'm not very technical when it comes to camera. I know when I want it to look like somewhat, but I leave it to the cinematographer to make it look pretty, right? Um, and the same went with editing. Olivia really knocked it out of the park where I usually had very minimal notes when it came to the edit. Um, it was, I believe, about a four to six week process. Like we took our time on it, um, but it felt like forever because a 30 minute film is a lot to edit. Um, but I thought that, you know, she already had so much experience editing that it was a very all around easy process for me as a director taking that second look. Um, so I just, yeah, I got very lucky with the editing process back then. Um, I definitely slept a lot in the editing booth. I, um, so basically we edited it, edit, edited it <laughs> as we were making it. And because I needed to see what it looked like because every single shot was at pro like sometimes there would be a shot and it would actually be like 30 shots because everything was composited and you know there's a lot of the computer screaming like we had to buy a lot of hard drives um so it was it was interesting and it was fun because I was discovering what it would look like as it was being made and I sort of it sort of had to be that way just so I could like a checklist be like visual a visual checklist what I would need to do next but because each shot isn't wasn't just one shot, it was like literally so many different layers and like artificial stuff. It was a very long, uh, extremely long editing process, <laughs> just for nine minutes too. I think. Um, mine was very like uh, Naomi's. It was like I I'm in the same way. Like I I have an idea. But if you're a greater cinematographer, go for it. Like, I'll be like, this is cool. This is cool. And let's do this different. Like, more just like looking more of like, if, if it's not exactly what I would want, then I would put some steps in. But then if not, if, not, if it's a perfect, then I'll be like, you know what? You're doing amazing. Let's keep on doing what you're doing. Um, and for the editing specifically, um, my partner was Eliana Spuente. And um, oh my God, he hated me by the end of it because I... Then we had to do a montage scene, but what we wanted to do, 
to make it look nice was um, have it to where like um, you see like the, the shoulder is like cut out, you know what I mean? And you mask it and another thing comes. So it looks like you can do like the camera sliding between rooms and he, he was hating it. He was doing like frame by frame. And he, I remember um, when he was doing it, like he was just like, why am I doing this? And I was like, I'm sorry. But when he did it, it was like a really good thing. And I think after that, that was like the hardest part of the editing process. And at the time I had no idea like how to do editing, but now um, seeing how he did it and seeing how um, we, I assisted and stuff, um, it was a fairly like just more of a, a learning as well as doing it at the same time, which was very helpful for us because by the end of it, we we're very proud of it. Um, I know he was very proud of that montage scene. Um, when we were looking at it during the film screen, he was like pointing at it. He's like, look, I did that. And I was like, you did it. Like, that was all you. Um, but I think that was the hardest part for sure. Um, but, you know, editing, like like Alejandro said, it takes a lot out of you for like 15 minutes or eight, nine minutes. It's like, I'm there for days just editing this, making sure it's all good. And um, I couldn't imagine 30 minutes. So that's, that's crazy for me. All right. And Olivia responded and said, thank you so much for trusting me. And I had a great time editing. Um, and then I have another question for everyone. And it is, what is one obstacle that uh, everyone ran into while filming and then something you learned from it? Mine was easy. Shooting, it wasn't, it was, it's like, it's hard to plan for it, but you should know better is shooting we had a lot of outdoor scenes in Sky. You know, you're a teenager. You don't always have the option of being at different places all the time, especially if you don't drive. Um, so we were shooting at the park. Um, you know, I think everybody has gone through this, even with indoor um, locations, especially for narratives. You and you're shooting dialogue. You can't have the AC on, and in Texas, not having the AC on is like dangerous. Um, so, and at the time we were filming our film, Sky Geisha was actually um, very far along in her pregnancy. So it, it, it's dangerous, you know? Um, so my biggest lesson at that time was knowing where you're shooting and making sure when you're writing this, maybe try to avoid some certain things. I thought, I think as I got older and started learning more of the production side too, is like, sometimes you can write to avoid big problems and um you learn to be creative and getting the scenes you want but being a little bit smarter about your locations I think was something that we really learned and the AC thing is a problem that industry-wide is an issue you know like you have to be on location you can't, and good sound means no AC so you gotta figure out your shoot schedule around that as well um but that was definitely a great lesson to learn a hard lesson to learn but albeit still an important lesson. Um, I'm trying to think. I think what I learned the most was a couple of things. Um, well, first of all, I learned, I just learned a lot of technical stuff um, making it. Um, I also learned slash realized that if you are trying to make a short film as a means of learning, not necessarily have having like a perfect plan, um, then it's 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 that's an option. Um, I also learned that budgeting is very important and that you shouldn't be shy about putting yourself out there for film grants because sometimes it seems like why would anybody ever want to you know you know some it's. As if you're an artist, there, there's always feelings of self doubt. So I learned that you got to put yourself out there if you do, because you know this stuff. You need budgets, and budgeting is very important. It can it pays for people eating, equipment. Um, so I did learn that uh, you got to put yourself out there if you're looking for funding. There are places, and it might be discouraging looking around for so long and not being able to find anything. But that's something I also learned. One thing I learned, um, especially in the beginning process of writing, it was um, trusting the process, like trusting that I'm doing something that I um, want to see on the big screen and trusting like the people I'm putting in positions and stuff. Um, 
I know on some set days, man, especially in the Texas heat, you want to leave. Like you want to go home. It's too hot. It's a stressful day. Something went wrong. But, you know, I remember at some point I was just really stressed out because, you know, we're on a time crunch. We want to make sure we get everyone in and out. Um, you know, make sure everyone's safe, make the scenes done and right and correct um, so we don't have to come back. Um, I remember there's some parts where I didn't trust the process, but um, at the end of it, I remember I was just like, I am happy I did. I'm happy I was able to um, complete the film. So I think it's, you know, trusting the process and making sure to understand um, a challenge was to understand like everyone else is in that stressful moment. You know what I mean? Everyone else is in that stress of wanting the greatest to come out of this. So it's going to be, you know, a little bit harder, um, but to always understand that like, hey, the person next to me is doing their 100%, like I'm doing my 100% and to just trust that and to continue. And I think if I never thought of that, um, I would have just, you know, I wouldn't even finished it. I would have even done the script. Um, like I didn't even want to complete writing the script because I was like, I cannot write 15 pages. And then one day I dropped 30 and they were like, okay, now we need to cut half. And I was like, okay, that's, I'd rather do that than struggle to write 15. Um, but it's also just, I trusted myself to do it. And then, so, you know, some spark of motivation came within me doing that and it made me um, create this film. So I was just the process. We have time for uh, one more question. Uh, this one will go to Yumi, our first presenter. Uh, in Sky, was there like a drawn importance to the idea of, for lack of better words, a role model uh, in like the LGBT community? Like, for example, being that Sky has her two friends who are out to kind of help guide her and like how that plays importance in like coming out in this case. So I really appreciate this question. Um, I really wanted that because from my personal experience, I, and looking back to, I realized that a lot of my closest friends as a kid, we all actually happen to be in part of the community, whether it be as bisexual or just queer in general, or even trans, um, we've all kind of, we all gravitated towards each other throughout middle school and high school and college. And, you know, outside of just your friends being your role models, you know, I realized as I got older is that I was kind of, as a kid, starved for that, like, positive representation of a queer person living their life. Because, you know, the older we've gotten and the more I've learned about the queer movement and pride is that because of the AIDS crisis, we lost out on a generation of people that passed away from a disease that no one really cared about. And those could have been those role models that we needed in the late 90s and early 2000s. They would have been the people that started, you know, raising families and trying to fight for maybe equal rights uh, in marriage a lot earlier. Um, but we didn't have them because they passed away so tragically. And now that we've kind of have that late millennial generation that didn't live through that crisis or they survived the crisis, they started becoming our role models, right? Or we had representation, but it was always like on Showtime or HBO, the O word, and queer ass folk. And that's not easily accessible by kids, right? The LGBTQ youth didn't have that access because it was really, you know, like rated R and like maybe too focused on the sexual part of identity and not just being a kid. Um, so because I found that that constant like craving, I found it on YouTube. I found it in like short films at different film festivals. You know, it was very rare for a kid to be writing about a quote unquote kid, right? A teenager writing about our stories. And so now that I've gotten older and be, like I said, with like the trans youth having to go through all this anti-trans legislation in sports and kids, it's like, I we need to write those. Like we're, the, we're that role model now. We've gone to that age where there are people younger that us need role models that want hope, that want somebody to look forward to. Like I, you know, as a kid, um, getting a little personal I was like I was very depressed at times because I realized now I didn't have a Asian American queer 
person to look up to in television or in music or in popular culture outside of like Suchin Park who's actually not queer she's just a Korean American but I thought she was really cool because she was always on MTV you know it was like hard to find everything that you hold in somebody else to look up to and have a future in so I was like am I gonna is there a life for me in the future outside of high school am I gonna have a family am I gonna have a partner am I gonna be happy doing this work um and so as storytellers I think that we do have not just necessarily responsibility but we have this like wonderful unique um gift to give to other people and to give hope to kids and adults you know that still haven't come out or haven't come to terms with their identity and I think that's a wonderful opportunity as storytellers to create that sense of hope you know like we don't have enough of it Thank you, Yumi. Um, well, it's time for us to wrap up. Uh, this was such an incredible and important and significant conversation. Uh, your work, it's very inspiring. And I wanted to uh, encourage you, all of you and our moderators to keep working, to keep creating art and exploring these issues uh, because it's really important. Uh, you are becoming role models uh, for our younger, younger artists. So. This is really, really important. I would like to um, thank you, uh, all the filmmakers, Yumi Park, Alejandro Peña, Carlo Rodriguez. I wanted to also thank our moderators, Sage Hernandez, Kristen Quintanilla, you were exceptional. Um, I would like to also take this moment to thank Alex Ramirez, our media arts, uh, teaching artist who is behind the scenes getting all of these happening. And Stacey, uh, Stacey Admin, uh, and everybody at Stacey who's been really working hard and making sure that we promote this event. Uh, it's been really successful. I'm really excited. This is um, our first uh, film series virtual event, and hopefully, be uh, first of many more to come. Um, oh, I wanted to remind everyone, audience members, if you didn't get a chance to watch the films, I we just put the link, uh, there's a Vimeo showcase. You can watch the three films. Uh, now that you know more about it, uh, all the films, and I think that's it. Anybody has anything else to say? Not, big no, round of pass. Oh, was great. Alejandro. I mean, it was, it was great to talk to you. Yeah, it was yeah great. thank you guys. Nice meeting you all. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for all the questions. They were wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Um, and for showing us your awesome and amazing films and your process and I know a lot of people are going to be like oh my gosh like wow I've learned a lot and I definitely learned a lot so thank you <laughs> yeah thank you guys a lot for kind of just you know being able to make these things and being like so openly authentic about it all and also a happy pride month <laughs> yes celebrating Pride Month and uh, tune in because we have other events happening at CAC. So make sure you go to our website or social media uh, and check out what's coming up. Thank you, everyone.